What's good, church? How y'all doing? Good, good. First off, before I begin today, I want to thank Pastor Jason uh, for giving us an opportunity to serve uh, our church today. Uh, when Jason and I began talking about a uh, potential opportunity for us to have kind of a student serve day, uh, we weren't sure um, what Pastor Jim was going to be speaking on, right? And so God does love us uh, because it's, it, it seems today that uh, Pastor Jim introduced the Adventures of Trust series. And so I get to speak about serving. And you can't make this stuff up. God is good all the time. <laughs> And, and I know it can seem because we are a, uh, a church of multiple campuses, it can feel like sometimes that we are a big church. But as you see here in Lorraine, we actually are a, a big church with small bodies. Right. And because of that, um, it takes a lot of serving uh, to make a lot of the things that you see happen. And so if you served in the last year at our church, would you mind rising for me? If you served at our church in the past year, would you mind rising? Can we give them a round of applause, please? Now, you guys can have a seat for me. Now, if you have not served, go ahead and stand up for me. Too. No, I'm just playing. We ain't going to do you like that. <laughs> and so before we begin today, what I wanted to do is take a moment to take a deep breath. That might be more for me than for you. <laughs> but y'all made it here today, <laughs> you know, because if we can be real and authentic in church, I know some of us, we come to church and we put on the fake smiles, the fake personas, because this is how we're supposed to act as Christians. But the reality is this Christian walk is hard. Uh, there's real stuff happening in the world and in our lives. And so would you turn to your neighbor and just say, thank God you made it. And for some of the people, y'all, you could not wait to get here on Sunday because God's been doing an amazing work in your life. So can I hear y'all today? Oh, that's all? That's it, huh? Okay. Okay, that's it. All right. Just me then. <laughs> so our passage today is going to be found in first Peter uh, chapter four, verse 10. And so I'll give you guys a second to find that in your Bibles and your apps. Um, and then if, if you have it, go ahead and it rises so we can read uh, God's word together. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and actually read this aloud for us here. So it's first Peter 410 says this. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. This is the word of God. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat for me. Amen. So each of you is where we're going to begin today. And I, I want to start with some context. Uh, so Peter is a disciple of Jesus Christ. All right. And Peter's writing this letter uh, to persecuted Christians who have been spread throughout about five regions of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Uh, the time frame is about 62 A.D. And the reason that's significant is that's around the same time we believe Paul, Paul was executed. Around the same time, James, the brother of Jesus, was executed. And around the same time that King Nero uh, began to set fires in Rome and then accused Christians of setting these fires. So this is an intense time. There's a lot of persecution happening right now. There's a lot of bad things happening right now. And Peter happens to be public enemy number one. This is the guy that everyone is after. And he's writing this letter to address... Um, Christian living, and its primary purpose is to encourage those to stay in the faith. He wants to remind you that Christ will sustain them even when the persecution is undeserved. He wants to remind them that Jesus is enough. Amen. And so before we take a deep dive into this world, word, let us pray today. So Father God, we, as we just even speak that out loud, there's many countries right now where Christians are being persecuted, that they are running and they are hiding. And God, here in America, we're so blessed with the gift that you give us to be able to come together. God, we pray for those who are in that fight and in that battle. But Lord, it is not because we have a great army that we are free. It is not because our government is so great that we are free. Lord, it is because of you. And so, God, as we pray that today, Lord, I pray for those who are facing those things, Lord. Lord, I pray that you just remove me from this equation. Make me small so that you can be big, God. And so I pray this in your name as we begin. Amen. Amen. So I want to start today with this phrase, each of you. 
Each of you, us includes you. So Peter is speaking to all types of Christians, right? He's speaking to Jews. He's speaking to Gentiles. He's speaking to those with jobs, those without jobs, speaking to those who are retired, speaking to those with kids, those without kids, those that possess plenty, those with very little, those who follow Christ for a long time, and those who have just begun their journey to follow Christ. Peter, Peter is speaking to them all. And although this letter, as we read the Bible, although these letters are not written to us, we believe that they were written for us for times such as these. So each of us includes you. See, here's where it gets tricky because the enemy is very good at twisting the inspired words of God. So he's crafty at creating these moments, maybe when we're in our Bible studies or when we hear it, where he says he uses our sin against us and he may say that, this isn't about you. This scripture isn't for you. You are disqualified. He seeks to exclude you from the promises of God. Because if he can make you feel like an outsider, he can limit your potential for purpose. So just in case you feel excluded today, here's some of the many people that God was able to use. Noah got drunk. Abraham was old. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was abused. Moses had a speech problem. Gideon was afraid. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was a murderer and a adulterer. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Joe went bankrupt. Peter denied Christ three times. Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Paul was a murderer. Timothy had health problems, and Lazarus was dead. Ladies and gentlemen, God can use anybody. So I'm here to tell you today that despite your mess, despite your mistakes, but despite your addictions, God not only can, but wants to use you. And if I can be transparent with you and share a little bit of my, about my testimony, most of my life, I believed I was a nobody. Because I was average at everything, right? I was average at sports, average and it came to the classroom, average in my creativity, average in my communication skills. I felt insignificant. And that, what that led me to do was become a liar. To do drugs, to sell drugs. I rob people, and I fought people. And when you're young, you're not thinking about the why. But as I got older, I realized these things I was doing was, in my heart of hearts, I wanted to be seen, to be noticed, to be accepted, to be respected. I wanted to matter to somebody. And at that time, it was lost people just like me. And when the Holy Spirit began to work in my life, God began asking me your very uncomfortable things. He said, go to the streets and pray with random people. Not me, God. Read the Bible. I don't like reading. Give that lady at the gas station $20. God, I'm broke. God, you got the wrong guy. I'm not who you think I am. Surely, you can't use me. Surely, there's someone better. Someone more qualified. Someone more educated. More financially secure. Because I'm average at everything. And Jesus kept saying, listen, I have a place for you. Stop running. Stop accepting this counterfeit of who you are. Because you were created in my image. And I have plans for you. And ladies and gentlemen, that's true of you too. That is true of every person in this room that you were created in God's image and he has plans for you. And I learned a very important lesson that became the launching point for a real faith. I learned grace. See, each of, each of us includes you. So right now in this moment, Jesus will never love you more than he does right now. 
despite your spin, despite your running. He hung on that cross and he said, don't take him. Don't take her. I want to take your place. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe shall not perish but have eternal life. That includes you. That's the kind of God I'm willing to fight for. That's the character of God. See, God shows his grace for us by giving us what we don't deserve. And once we soak in that we don't deserve the things that we have, that it's not our hard work that we got it, that it's not my dedication to the craft. Once we understand it is because God's grace, that becomes the motivation to serve God. Because I don't deserve it. I did not work for it. God has given it to me. Amen. Justified and righteous. So we talked about this in youth group not too long ago as we were unpacking John 3.16. And it came to the point where it was kind of like, okay, God so loved the world. He gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, have everlasting life. But why wouldn't God just wipe it all away? Why did Jesus have to die? And so often, you know, in today's society, when people do something wrong, it goes hashtag free this person. Hashtag free this person. Are they guilty? Because if they're guilty, what is justice? So we are living apart from God. We are drowning in our sin with no hope to ever change. The Bible tells us in Romans, the wages of sin is death. That is a high cost to pay. And it would not be justice if God said, I'm going to let you get away with it, though. Even though you've broken my perfect law, I'm going to let you get it away with it and invite you to the kingdom anyways. That's not justice. So by his grace, he took that punishment. So justice could be deserved despite what we deserve. That is, that is justified and righteous in the sight of God. So he cleanses us, right? He cleanses us of, of all our darkness, our brokenness, and of our sins so we could be made righteous and holy in the sight of God. Do you believe you're holy this morning? And for some of you who don't believe that, that's what God did on the cross. He was making you new again. And so holy things, unholy things cannot enter the kingdom of God. So when he dies on the cross, he justified you and made you righteous and made you holy. Amen. Qualified. You are qualified at the time you put your trust in Jesus. And this whole series about is, the, is about the adventure of trust. And so you are qualified at the time you put your hope in Jesus. So that includes you today. So I'm going to encourage you to stop running. Stop accepting this counterfeit version of who the world wants you to be because you are made in the image of God. And as we look back at this passage, I'm thinking of Peter. What a journey he's been on. He went from being a fisherman to being a disciple of God. He went from losing his faith as he was walking on the water to being called the rock of the church. He went from denying Jesus three times to preaching of how great Jesus is. He went from cutting a dude's ear off to healing those with diseases. When he says each of you, he is speaking from experience of God's grace. How many of you have experienced God's grace in your life? So each of us qualifies at the time that we put our trust in Jesus. Now, if you've already made that step in your walk, you qualify. Even if you've fallen off, you qualify. If you've yet to make that step, I want to encourage you to talk to someone after. And this ain't about saying no prayer. This is about helping you begin the adventure of becoming like Christ. And so I want to take a moment and pray for those who may not know Jesus today, who may not have put their trust in Jesus. Let me pray on that. Father God, we come to you today. Lord, I pray that you would wrap your hearts 
around those people who feel like they're too far gone, that they've sinned too much. Lord, I pray for those who feel shame, that Satan continues to use that shame to stop them from their true purpose. Lord, I pray for those who feel chain because they just keep falling for the same old sin over and over. Lord, make us new. Lord, give us the strength to follow you. Amen. Amen. First Peter 4.10, well, as we continue, says this, should use whatever gift you have received. So what is a gift? And I, I, I researched a couple of different places, and I, I landed on Google because it's the most simple version. And it says this, something given without a payment. <laughs> that is a gift. So something you don't pay back, something you did not earn, but you received it. That is a gift. So the Greek word here in the original text was harisma, which means is where we get our word for charisma from which can be broken down into mean this, a gift of grace. You see a trend here? You see a trend here? Now notice here, Peter isn't concerned, like in many places of the Bible, we'll see gifts mentioned. But Peter isn't trying to be particular or specific or ranking or comparing gifts. His biggest concern here is helping believers see that each of us possess God's gift right now in this moment. Amen. Yeah, we can clap for that. So if you have accepted Christ as your Lord, not only do you qualify, you have already received it. What we waiting on? You possess God's gift right now. So you don't have to wait till you become a better Christian. You don't have to wait till you know more about the Bible. You don't even have to wait till you get your life together. You possess it now. But the truth is now all those things are good. All those things will help you deepen your roots as a believer. But the moment you accept Christ, you are given a gift. Amen. And I know some of you guys, are, if you're like me, because I was average at everything, you remember. <laughs> you wonder, man, what is my gift? Like, I could never get up there and stand and talk in front of people. I don't know how to play an instrument. Uh, I'm not good with my hands. Like, what are my gifts? And so here at Open Door, we actually have a process that you can begin. It's called a shape survey. So if you were to go to our website uh, and go to resources, discipleship, and find your servant profile, that can give you some framework. Now, is it going to be perfect? No. Are there going to be some times where you're not sure if you agree or disagree, so you have to put something in order to continue? Sure. But this gives you some framework of what are your gifts. Because ultimately, what we want to do is we want you serving in your gift, not serving just to fill a gap. Okay? We want you to serve because here's the thing. When you start serving in your gift, it ain't a job. Right? It ain't a job. You enjoy it. And that, because that's how God created you to be. So as we kind of continue on this scripture here, each of us possess God's gift right now today in this moment. But here's the thing. The gift you have received, its purpose is not for you. Now, before y'all start throwing stones, you're like, wait a minute, ain't grace for everybody, Joe? Let's look at the text. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. And so that little word, too, is a connecting word. And we use that word meaning in order to. So you receive the gift in order to serve others. So we don't take these gifts and take advantage of them, use them for our own benefit. Right? That's what a lot of us want to do. Oh, I was blessed this way. Let me, let me see what kind of cash flow I can get out of this. Let me see how I can go on a couple extra vacations out of this. And ain't nothing wrong with vacation, you know. I ain't trying to say that now. But what I am trying to say is these gifts should also be benefiting others. Amen. We use our gifts to serve others. Amen. Serving others means you are, being, you are doing something primarily for the benefit of another person. And I don't know how you guys study the God's word because there's many, many different forms out there. But I'm, all, I'm constantly, you know, because I'm an average guy, I don't got a wide vocabulary. So I got to look some words up sometimes. <laughs> And serve others is a power phrase to me. And it's a power phrase because it's, it's powerful because it's contradictory to what our natural, our natural bodies want to do, right? Our natural bodies do not want to serve others. What we want to do is what's best for us? 
What will help me obtain my goals? What's going to bring me happiness, make me prosper, and make my life easier? And if you're married right now, you could look at that. How many things are you telling your husband or wife to do because it's going to make your life easier? <laughs> Point taken. But that's, that's not servanthood. Servanthood is like, I want to make someone else's life easier. So each of you has received a gift in order to so that you are able to serve others. It's been gifted to you by God's grace. You did not earn it. You did not deserve it. That grace is meant to be passed on to others. So when you receive that grace, the reason you receive it is so that you can go give it. What a lot of us want to do is we want to dig the grace in the ground so we can pull it out when we need it. I'm going to hide it right here. This grace is for me. So when I mess up, hey, you're supposed to operate out of grace. But we don't want to share it. We don't want to apply it when somebody else wrongs us. It's meant to be shared with those that you like, those you don't like, those that you get along with, those that you don't get along with, those that you understand their ways and those you don't understand their ways. Grace is given to you so that you can bless others. Exercise this gift given to you. All of us should do that. In our next slide here, you see a couple of good-looking fellas. Uh, so this is my man Don, uh, my man Sarkis, and of course me right there. And I'm just going to say this. Anytime you get a white dude, a Puerto Rican, and a Mexican black together, something about to go down. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? I just want to tell you that right now. And so we decided one day we was going to go fishing. You know what I'm saying? And we got Don, my brother Don, he was blessed. He worked really hard. He, he, he was blessed with a boat. Sarkis, blessed with the knowledge and all the skills uh, to be a great fisherman. And of course, me, I'm average of everything. <laughs> and so we decided we were going to go fishing. And uh, I think Sarkis caught one fish at this point. And we decided, hey, let's take a little bit of a break. Um, and there we see we're, we're on a dock. And we see a young man uh, sitting on a dock and just kind of looking across the water. And he looks mesmerized by it. And so as, as, as we pass there, uh, you know, Don just looks at him and says, hey, have you ever been on a boat? He's like, oh, no, never. I'm scared to death of the water. He's, he's, like, he's like, I don't know how to swim. And uh, Don looks at him and says, you want a ride? And he's like, what? You offer me a ride on a boat? And he's like, sure, yeah, I'll give you a ride. And so each of us, we, we, we took our little break, and we come back, and he gets on the very front of the boat. And me and Sarkis are back there just watching kind of in awe at this brother taking this in. Never, ever seen the water from this moment. Never seen it in this position. Always looking on the dock. And I wonder sometimes, do people look at the Christian walk and think, how many of y'all are sitting on the dock, dock right now? And you're looking at other people and you're thinking, man, only if I was that guy. Only if I had that boat. And so what Don did is he invited him on the boat. And you see these moments as this, this, he goes from smiling, and then all of a sudden the water picks up and he goes to being scared. Is that supposed to happen? And as we drop him off, I just felt really compelled to, like, pray for him. And I asked the brother, I said, hey, uh, if God could do one thing in your life right now, like, what would it be? He said, bring me peace. And I went ahead and prayed for him. And after that moment, he said, I just got to tell you guys something. I'm never, ever going to forget this in my life. Amen. This was a grown man. This is not a little boy. This is a grown man. And then I asked him before he left, I said, let me ask you a question. You've never been on a boat before. You don't know how to swim. Like, why'd you get on the boat? He said, I don't know. Something about you three, I felt like I could trust you. Amen. 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 <laughs> like, that's how you exercise your gift. Don, having the boat, blessed somebody else. Did he have to do that? Could we have just walked right by him? Absolutely. Do we do it every day? Absolutely. But that day, Don said, I'm going to exercise my gift. And then after he got off the boat, Don looks at me and says, Joe, thank God you were here because I could never do that. I said, Don, you had the boat. <laughs> Don, you had the boat. 
And like all that story is the same, we should exercise our gifts. But why is Peter using this kind of language at this present time? There's a lot going on as at the very beginning of the, of the word today. I shared what was going on. A lot of persecution is happening. You know, people are dying. And, and for us, that's the time where we, we go ahead and say, I got to take care of mine right now, Peter. Like, chill out, homie. Like this whole servant people, I'm just trying to do what's good for my family right now. I mean, they coming for us, Peter. Don't you know? But why is he so passionate about serving people in this moment? So it's football season, right? And so some of y'all might be familiar with what this means. What's that mean, y'all? That's the fourth quarter. That's the fourth quarter. And if anyone knows what that means, it means now it's time to give it all you got. Like we in the fourth quarter, y'all. Once that clock hits zero, that's it. And really, isn't the game always about the fourth quarter? We seen y'all, we seen y'all Browns last week. You know what I'm saying? We seen y'all Browns last week. You had the game won. Fourth quarter couldn't hang on to it. Sad, really. <laughs> but it's not how you start. It's how you finish. Amen. Because here's the truth, y'all. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. So Peter 100% believes that Jesus is returning. But do you? Do you believe Jesus is returning? Because Peter is saying, while we here on this temporary earth awaiting Christ's return, we are we got. Everybody else, they coming for us. So this, we all we got. Church, do you believe Christ is returning? Are you living like it? If so, what will you be doing in the fourth quarter of your own life? Better yet, what if this is your fourth quarter? Because in that fourth quarter, will you just let it be the responsibility of an older person to serve others? Most weeks, every Sunday, when we look out here, I see, I think I even calculated the average age of service in this church are over 50. And some of us will say, well, they retired, they got the time, but do they? Or will we allow it to be the young people of the church? And say, I did my time. I'm time for me to chill. Yeah. <laughs> or will you knowing Christ's return is imminent, be willing to serve others? Church, we all we got. My son used to play basketball and football, and he had a lot of issues with self-doubt early. And I would, I would tell him this. If not you, then who? If somebody got to be great, why not you? Why not you? And I want to bring up my brother, Brother Dave, one more again, one of our dear brothers who just passed and went with the Lord a few weeks ago. I seen him at prayer on Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., lively, praying, and only hours later, he went to be with the Lord. Guess what Dave was doing in his fourth quarter? Serving others. The man literally had a heart attack as he's, as he's, as he's helping an uh, elderly woman move. They found freedom in serving others. He was exercising God's gift of grace to him. So Peter believes 100% Jesus was returning, and he was encouraging all Christians to finish strong because Jesus is coming. Peter 4, 7 through 8 says this, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. So your love of God should naturally flow into loving people. And when you love people, you're surrendering your own wishes, your own desires for the benefit of another. And so that's the kind of living surrender God is glorified in. When we love one another well, what we do is we can begin to see past some of the sins and some of the mishaps because we are exercising the grace given to us. Yes, now, in case I'm losing you, I got a habit of talking fast, especially with a couple cup of coffee in me. <laughs> Here's where we're at so far. 
Are you qualified? Are you by putting our trust in God? So you qualify by putting your trust in God. That's the first step. You exercise the gift given to you in order to emphasize others above yourself. The gift is not for you. It's for you to share. And in closing here, as faithful stewards of God's grace, do you want to be known as a faithful steward? According to Hebrews 11, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. Because we can be confident in God and assured that his word is true, we can remain faithful to the responsibility of passing on his grace. So how can we do that? It's by serving. Commit to something. So many of us walk in and out of church. We're just there for the message, and then we go on about our ways. And remember what I said at the beginning. Satan wants to isolate you. Because if he can isolate you, he can stop you from becoming who you're made to be. So I want to invite you in. Invite you in. Commit to something. Just do something. For me, my just do something started, I was a security in Elyria, a church at Open Door in Elyria. I started out by doing security. And if I can be real honest, like there would be times that I would be high coming into church. Yep, keeping it real. But God was still working with me, right? God was still working with me. And I said, hey, you know what? But I knew I needed Jesus. So I said, I got I to gotta sign up and I got to commit to something because if I don't commit to anything, I'm going to fall for everything. So I committed, I'm going to do this, and God began to do a work in me. And God said, I got something else for you. I want you to go and be a volunteer to the youth in Elyria. So I started to be a volunteer for the youth, and then God said, I got something else for you. I want you to start a basketball program in Lorraine. You're going to get this building, and it's going to be broken down, but I want you to use it anyways. We started a basketball program, 50 guys coming there, dudes from the streets. My man, Tony, he started out as a volunteer playing the keys at the Avon Lake campus. He's, a, he's the worship director here. My homegirl, Tammy, Tammy, my heart, without her, this youth ministry would not operate the way it does. She has been a gift to me. She started out in the tech booth. Darius, my man, Darius, he started helping me out at basketball. He, he came in here as a stranger. He said, I just want to come and look at the building. But God had another plan. <laughs> he started helping me out with basketball. Then he became a volunteer in youth ministry, and there he sits right there in that chair. Amen? <laughs> Jainer and Jazz, you started out by putting slogans on T-shirts just to, just to create conversation. Now they serve in kids' ministry. My man Hector, my man... Decided, using his talents, he went down there, painted some murals on the wall. Now he's in men's ministry. Speaking of that, if you are not in our men's ministry, you're missing out. Tuesdays at 6.30, we meet. It's called Fight Club. You do have to fight Jason first, though. <laughs> okay? So come with it, because looks can be deceiving. All right? But just do something. Have faith God will work out the details. Because here's, here, here's the realness, y'all, is that real faith begins when it costs you something. If you, if you just come to church, do your own little thing, it's costing you nothing to serve God. It's costing you nothing. But until your faith costs you something, you're just religious. What is your faith costing you? It costs the disciples their life. Steward. This word steward means an overseer or manager of someone else's property. And since everything is a gift of God's grace, we're just managing it. How are you doing with your grace? Would you fire yourself? Or would you get a promotion? So we have a responsibility as Christians to maintain and use wisely the gifts and resources God has given us. Because it's all because his grace that we even have it. Amen. 
grace. Moved up ahead a little bit. As a steward of God's grace. So that he is glorified above ourselves. So that other people are benefiting more than us. Church, if you want to know a real deal church, you want to know what a real church looks like, it's a church that serves one another. When we look at the church in Acts, like, didn't nobody go without? And so here's the thing, like, a lot of us will say when we find out that someone's in need, hey, man, I'm going to pray for you. Knowing we got 50K in the bank and we can pay that water bill, we talking about we want to pray for them. Do it. Handle it. And for those that have little, maybe can't do anything financially, can you come and serve some coffee? It costs you nothing but your time. I heard it put once this way. A good and faithful steward is like an attentive pilot. Continually examine the course as they fly to see if he's still on the flight pattern that has been set by the tower. That tower is Jesus. The faithful steward will routinely make the necessary mid-course corrections to his life, regardless of how subtle or drastic they are. Have you been a faithful steward? Have you been loyal? Have you been committed? Have you managed God's grace in your life? Or have you gotten off course? So I want to encourage you today to leave past everything, leave in the past all that other stuff, what it was. Make today the day that you radio into the tower and say, I'm lost. I've been searching. I've been trying to figure it out on my own, but help me find my way back home. And so in closing, if you got anything out of today, I want you to know that you are qualified. You are qualified to exercise your gift. And you exercise your gift by deciding that I'm going to serve, I'm going to use my gift. And if you don't know what that is, go back to that shape survey. See what that is. That's literally what I did when I was doing security. And it said youth ministry and men's ministry. <laughs> and God, God made a way for me to be in youth ministry. You can do that. By emphasizing others. So that love God, love people. Like, I, I know sometimes we say this, oh, I hate people. Like, that don't line up with God. <laughs> that don't line up. That do not read. Amen. Maximize your faith. Because until you start serving, you're not giving anything up. And the Christian walk, he says, pick up your cross, follow me. And that cross ain't light. It's going to be heavy. And we do all of these things in order to glorify God. That's what we're doing. We, our goal is to glorify the Father. And just in wrapping up, y'all, I don't, I don't know where y'all are at. And my intention today was not to wrestle no feathers or offend anyone. Because here's the thing. As many of you are already serving. Okay. And I applaud you. I applaud you for that. So I'm not asking you to serve somewhere else. What I'm asking is the congregation of those people who have not stepped into serving. To say that you are qualified. And if not you, then who? And so my prayer today is that we would do this. Uh, well, there's going to be some opportunities, so many opportunities to serve, and some of them are in our church, some of them are outside our church, but you'll have an opportunity to do that and respond. Even our young people. Y'all give it up for our young people, though, for helping us out today. <laughs> there is nothing stopping a young person saying, hey, I want to serve. You know, can I do the coffee bar? Can, can I hand out the bulletin? Yes. Let's get you on a schedule. Because here's the thing, right? If we all just took one, one week, it would be su such not a burden on anybody. Can, can we all do something once a month? Sure. It's tough to do it four weeks in a row. I get that. But if everybody steps up, no one has to do that. 
And that's the beauty of it all, right? That's the beauty of when we work together, we better together, as my man Tony said. And so I want to pray on this today, guys. And that's my closing. Um, I hope that you uh, were encouraged today in some way, shape, or form. And I'm going to pray us out. So if we want to bring the worship team back on stage, and let's bow our heads. Father, you are so good. Lord, I, uh, I pray that we understand that in this adventure of trust that we are on, that we trust you. That we trust you with the gifts that you've given to us, our time, our, our resources, our gifts. God, you, these are tough times. Lord, as we go out to different stores and um, places like that, what we see is just everybody needs help, including the church. And so, God, would you make a way um, to, to just convict those that need convicting? Um, Lord, for those that just, hey, I just need to take a shape survey first, Lord, would you let that be okay? Let us not shame anyone into serving. That's not what the hope is. But Lord, the, the goal is to put people in their giftings, not to fill gaps and spaces. And so, God, I pray today for those that who, who don't know who you are, who came in there today with a homie. And maybe this is the first time they're hearing your truth. God, they're included. They qualify by putting their trust in you. Help us, help us emphasize people more, God. Help us love better, especially with our, our wives and our kids, husbands. Lord, help us to live it out and help us to have a deep-rooted faith. I pray this in all your name. Amen.